And the key factor to understanding spiritual growth and maturity is in this uh, final section, that we need to be transformed, not conformed. That means we need to renew our mind. And uh, Apostle Paul wrote to Romans this in uh, chapter 12 too. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may, that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And I think this is the key component to all of our growth and maturity. When we allow the Holy Spirit to change my thinking, I used to think like this, now the Holy Spirit is renewing my mind and I'm thinking totally differently. I used to have the wrongful thoughts, I used to have the wrongful perceptions, I used to not love people, not accept them, I used to be greedy, I used to be selfish, I used to be self-centered, but because I'm allowing the Holy Spirit to renew my mind, it's like, wait a minute, Another Bible passage says, for we have the mind of Christ. Wait a minute, I know this is wrong. I'm being selfish. For an example, for those of you who had little kids, does your four-month-old infant at two o'clock in the morning, before it opens its mouth and starts crying, is it thinking about mom and dad and the whole house that's sleeping? Help me out here, mamas. No. That infant... In their mind, the only thing they're thinking is, uh, I'm hungry thing right now. They open their mouth, wah, wah. Where's mama? Mama needs to come and feed me. Or the baby goes into the diaper and the baby's uncomfortable. It does not matter. You'll be at a special event, at a wedding, at a church service. As soon as the baby feels uncomfortable, it's going to let everybody know, I am the center of attention. It's like, shh, we're at church. Can't you see the pastor's preaching? No matter how much you try to say that to an infant, the infant, the only thing they have in their mind is, I have a need, I have a problem, I have a concern. And it's normal. But what happens when that similar mindset is in a Christian, in a follower of Christ? It's all about me. So here, Apostle Paul is challenging us, look, our spiritual growth and maturity consists with us renewing our mind. What does that mean? A few thoughts. We need to have the mind of Christ. The missing word, the mind of Christ, as I already quoted that Bible verse, 1 Corinthians. But we have the mind of Christ. What does the mind of Christ mean? That our inner transformation and the renewal comes through what? In order for us to have the mind of Christ, we have that internal transformation and the renewing. That comes from the living word of God. It could come from prayer and fasting, investing into our spiritual growth. That means whether it's reading books, conferences, seminars, uh, the school of discipleship like this, or even serving people. So here, Apostle Paul is challenging us. Look, guys, we cannot remain spiritual infants. There needs to come a time and season in our life we need to grow. And the key component to our growth is a changed mindset, is a renewed mindset. When you say to yourself, you know what? I used to think like this, but now I'm beginning to change my thoughts concerning that. Why? Because I'm allowing God's word to infiltrate into my life. I'm allowing God's word to challenge me by saying, hey, wait a minute, Stan. You know, there was a time I used somebody to reach out to you to serve you. But now you're saved. You're washed by the blood of Jesus. Now I want to use you as my disciple. I want to use you as my vessel to reach out to others, to bless others. As that theme that we've been talking about lately, it's not about me. This is where that maturity comes in. And here Apostle Paul is once again, he's challenged us. We need to become transformed, not conformed. And that happens as we carry or have the mind of Christ. All right? Next section is going to be a very interesting one when it comes to the cost of discipleship. Uh, just the other day, uh, there were two individuals at our church talking after church, and I kind of jumped in a conversation. And one person took the side, well, you know, if you really want God to use you, you're going to go through a lot of trials and persecution. And the other person took the other side. And, you know, I just wanted to go in the middle of conversation, say hi, but they kind of pulled me in, saying, what are your thoughts? But anyway, uh, you know, I tried my best to share some of those thoughts. Uh, the thing is this, when it comes to trials, persecution, opposition, it's not fun to talk about that. I just want to love Jesus. I just want to go to church. I just want to... I just want you know sing a few songs and that's it you know leave me alone okay sure they may happen in your life but as soon as you make a decision that hey I'm going to change my life around 
I want God to use me. I want to impact my neighborhood. I want to bring kingdom influence into my work. I want to bring God into school. As soon as you start making those internal decisions, guess what? You're going to have opposition. I remember back in Massachusetts, we decided to do our first um, uh, school um, outreach event. Uh, and uh, the principal told us right away, no, you can't do that. Actually, it's not even legal. We're like, hmm, that's interesting. How, how come I read about other schools doing this, uh, other states? Is it just only uh, the state I live in? So I started to do research. And when I researched through that state, back then it was Massachusetts, I'm like, wait a minute, by law, no. They cannot prevent us from doing this. <laughs> but because I was not attending that school, and that girl who was part of uh, the leadership team of our youth ministry back then, I'm like, hey, you know what? When you go next time, talk to the principal about this event. If he declines you, remind him about the law. And when she did, he got a little bit nervous because he knew he was, you know, doing something against the law. He couldn't forbid us. And eventually, the event happened. I think we called it Chosen Generation event. Uh, it was great. We did it every year after year. But the point is, as soon as we wanted to do something great for God, boom, opposition. And this is normal for any of us who truly want to grow in the Lord. So what does that mean? For us to be uh, true disciples of Christ, we're going to be tested. Just like the three friends, the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were tested in the fire furnace. Let me read you 1 Peter chapter 1, chapter 1, 6 through 7. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold, that perishes, through it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. What does that mean? The Bible is full of uh, good examples. That's the missing word. The Bible is full of good examples of biblical characters or individuals we personally admire and look up to who faced many difficulties, trials, sufferings, or persecution. So let us quickly evaluate some of these individuals. And as we evaluate them, I think one of the challenges for us as God's children right now in our current modern day, when we read through the Bible or through church history, we understand persecution in a form of somebody's trying to physically put harm to me. They want to put me to jail. They want to throw me uh, in the lines. They want to cut me up. And as history records how Christians were tortured for their faith over all the centuries. And we, when we hear the word, oh, persecution, trials, oh my goodness, I, I don't want nobody to physically harm me. Right now, we're not facing that, at least in this country. Some countries are. But there's different forms of trials and persecutions we can go through. So let us just quickly analyze some of these biblical personas that we're very familiar with. People who, you know, face their own type of tests and trials. Daniel. Daniel was thrown into the lion's den because he chose to publicly pray to God. He made a decision. I don't care what the law, the, the king just made a new law, a new decree. I'm going to still pray to God. And that got him into hot water. Number two, his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, were thrown into the fiery furnace because they chose not to bow down to the golden idol. But even through that test, we see a miracle because when they're in the furnace, there was a fourth meal. Number three, Apostle Paul. He's got a long resume. Excuse me. Apostle Paul was stoned to death, shipwrecked, and beaten up numerous times because he boldly preached the gospel of the kingdom. And that still did not stop him. Then we have Stephen, who became the first martyr. He was stoned to death while Saul, uh, at that moment, was witnessing that for preaching boldly about Jesus. Or how about John the Baptist? Was in prison for speaking boldly against Herod's unlawful marriage and then eventually had his head chopped off uh, because, uh, the, because uh, uh, well, the daughter, Herod's um, yeah, the answer and uh, whatever you want and listen to mom my mama says give me the head of John the Baptist and last but not least Jesus was endlessly criticized persecuted and even crucified so this is just a small outline of biblical personas people who faced various trials various tests now does that mean because of your faith someone's going to throw you in the zoo into the lines that no it's not who can actually, uh, help me out here for a second. 
What can we right now in our modern day culture, what can we, I guess, somehow compare to what is persecution against our faith today, our Christian faith? Give me some examples. No, no, I'm serious. But, the, but there's a lot of persecutions right now. We, as the body of Christ, as believers, are facing, even in America. It's not harming our physical body. How about the brainwashing in our academia and in our schools concerning gender identity, concerning same-sex marriage? There's a lot. The list can go on and on. Because the thing is this. When I was growing up, if I can share a quick testimony. I think I was around age 12, 13. My first encounter with a pornographic magazine was around age 12 or 13, and the neighbor unpurposely threw the magazine over, uh, over their fence into our yard, where me and my brother discovered it, and we're like, whoa, what is this? And then it left the wrong image and impression. But that was back then. Right now, I don't have my phone with me, it's recording. Our younger generation can access similar content, unlimited, just at a touch of a finger. Back then, something that we was very hard for us as teenagers to obtain, whether it's a magazine or a video, for different reasons, okay? Now it's very accessible. So what the enemy is doing is, okay, is making sin such free, such abundant, that it's hard for us to distinguish, okay, is this right or is this wrong? So. What we as God's children are right now experiencing as a persecution, as a trial, as testing, it's on a whole different level. Just because my physical body is not feeling hurt or pain because I'm afraid they're gonna, you know, cut me into pieces like they did hundreds of years ago for the faith, it does not mean that persecution is not there. So just a little bit of a context uh, concerning what, what we call the heroes of our faith had to endure in the Bible. But then we have the following, uh, what does it mean to follow in the footsteps of Jesus? When we gave our hearts to our Savior, let's continue this talk. Lord Jesus, on that special day in our personal lives, it was truly transformational and a historical moment. But many new converts, or should I say born again Christians, failed to read the fine print. What is that fine print in the, in the Bible? As we understand, the fine print outlined not only all of the blessings we'll receive in the walk with the Lord, but also a great deal of difficulties. What are some of these difficulties? There are criticism, trials, tribulations, backstabbing, betrayal, problems, or even some form of persecution, however it is. Okay? So, and uh, I was reading this morning uh, in John uh, chapter, uh, actually, who can read that for me? Who has their Bible on, on them? Uh, read uh, Gospel of John 16, 33. Let me have their phone out. Amplified version, if you, if you have the Bible verse. I made a note in here. Concerning different trials and tribulations, even Jesus reminds us about. Which version? Uh, no, just Gospel of John. Gospel of John 16, 33. If you have the Amplified, that's awesome. If not, it's okay. Well, she's just searching. I'm going to read the next point. Being a true follower of Jesus has many benefits and blessings, the missing word. But it also has many difficulties, as Jesus reminds his disciples when he said, and in John 15, 18, we read, If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. This is very important for us to understand. If we're disciples of Jesus and we're following after him, what they did to him, they will view us no different than him. In John 15, 20, Remember the word that I said to you. A servant is not greater than his own master. If they persecuted me, Jesus talking, they will also persecute you. And that persecution has many different faces. Are we able to find it? Go ahead. Well, I have told you these things so that in me you may have perfect peace. In the world you have tribulation and distress and suffering, but be courageous. I have overcome the world. There you go. Jesus reminds us, in the world, you'll have different problems, issues, tribulations, suffering. But I have overcome all of that. And I think that's the key verse, that whatever we may interpret as 
a problem, as a trial, as an issue in love, in life, it comes in different forms. Remember that Jesus overcame that. And in him, we have that peace. In him, we have that peace. And that's something that we need to grab a hold of. Okay? So that's important concerning uh, that being a disciple of Christ, we are not exempt from trials of life. We are not exempt from facing certain oppositions or betrayals or, or people lying to us, stealing from us. We're not exempt from that because we are living, guys, in a very corrupt world. We're living, that's why we need to become the light in this dark world. But we become the light in this dark world when we understand these truths and we find peace in Christ. And that's one of the ways we're able to actually overcome all that darkness and that evil that comes against us. Another thing for us to understand about the cost of discipleship is we are in the army of Christ. Who can help me read 2 Timothy chapter 2, 3 through 4? You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. Yes. What does that mean? A few thoughts about us being in the army of Christ. We need to come. We need to convert Christian daycares into spiritual military boot camps. In other words, kind of going off of that theme, like, hey, let's not be pampering one another, but actually be strengthening one another so we can become strong spiritual warriors. Next point, our drill sergeant, who is like a type of the Holy Spirit, and the Word of God that serves as the commandments uh, that strengthen our inner spiritual man. Who can tell me what is one of the main primary goals of the enemy of our soul? The devil. Kill, steal, Kill, steal, and to destroy. Just those three descriptions, they're very serious. Okay? How many of you have uh, like read or heard stories in the news that somebody tried to break into the house to steal and then the owner of the house defended themselves and somebody got hurt or somebody got killed? Have you guys, you know, read? We all have. It happens a lot of times. Okay? It could happen at home. Somebody runs into the store, tries to bring some harm. Okay, Because there's people who have evil intentions and they will do whatever they want to actually get what they want, even if they have to harm somebody. Okay, And people who are able to protect themselves, whether it's through a weapon, through their physical body, they do it if they can. And the enemy of our soul, the devil, he's not here to play games with us. This is the reality. He's not here to say, hey, okay, well, you know, let's, let's talk this out. Let's play Monopoly together. You know, let's play cards. No. He's actually here to kill, to steal, and to destroy. He's on a mission. And we understand that in accordance to this specific passage, let me read it again. You, therefore, must endure hardship as a good soldier. I like how Apostle Paul is challenging the young Timothy. You need to be strong. Anybody ever watch uh, videos how they, or actually, let me ask this question. Anybody been trained in the military, in the army? Anybody? I know mo most of us, you know, kind of voted if we're born in here. I know some countries, as soon as you turn age 18, they, well, you know, but by law, you have to be in there. I know America doesn't practice that. I I've watched, you know, some videos, it's like, I don't really remember watching documentary videos where I saw the soldiers sit in the jacuzzi. Oh, man. This is good to be in the army. <laughs> you won't see that there. I see them crawling through dirt. I see them at the end of their you know, boot camp, bruised up, scratched up, shaking, cold, summer crying. I, in other words, they're enduring a lot of hardship. Why are those soldiers have to endure so much hardship? Who can tell me? Simple answer. Why do they train them and they really almost like, almost like legally torturing them? Speaking, why? Why did they do that? Oh, so they can survive if they were to actually to be put into a war zone. That they would know that, hey, I got separated from my company. I'm going without food. It's cold outside. It's raining outside. But I went through my training. And I think this is one of the missing components for us as the body of Christ. That we, we want to get comfortable. Oh, Lord, give me more of your sunlight. I just want to be cozy in your presence. It's good. You can be cozy in his presence. But we also have to understand that we're living in a world that's full of evil. 
We're living in a in a world that's full of darkness. And the enemy of the soul is not gonna come to you while you're out there suntan in the presence of the Lord and put some suntan lotions on you. Oh, Paul, I don't want you to get more. Here's some suntan. No. He's out there after us to destroy us, to divert us from God's perfect will. Then Apostle Paul uh, used this illustration is Apostle Paul in the Bible is like a type of a drill sergeant. And we read uh, in the first Corinthians, he addresses this note. Paul had this advice to the new believers, and this is what he said. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I fought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, like I matured, I put away, I put the ways of childhood behind me. So here Apostle Paul is just giving a small illustration of how a child develops from a little child to a teenager to a young man. And as soon as I became a young man, I put away all those child things. And I think that's once again, Apostle Paul is challenging us as God's children. We need to grow up. We need to mature. We need to become more and more like Christ. Instead of, you know, being very weak and feeble, we need to learn how to fight our own spiritual battles. There was a season in my life uh, when I was going through, you know, different uh, uh, problems or trials. I'll reach out to my friend, hey, pray for me. Uh, I just, this, this battle is tough for me. Help me out here. And it's good that you can go to a friend or a pastor to pray. But when spiritual maturity comes in, as the Apostle Paul says, we are part of the army. You have to learn how to fight for yourself. If you feel that you're going through a season of, of, a, of attack of an enemy or you're going through a certain situation in your life, we as God's children, we need to learn how to spiritually fight. We need to learn how to stand in prayer by saying, okay, Lord, I do not understand what's happening in my life right now. I, I feel that I'm weak. I feel that the enemy is attacking me, but I'm going to stand. I'm going to pray. I'm going to intercede. I'm going to believe in you to give me the breakthrough instead of just saying, oh, please don't hurt me, devil. And I think this is a good sign of spiritual maturity that we as God's children, we need to exercise. And here Apostle Paul, he's challenging us. Look, guys, we are like soldiers who were enlisted into the army of Christ. And as we kind of go towards conclusion on the following page, a few more thoughts and ideas before we wrap up, that there is a cost to discipleship. Here's a thought. Being a disciple of Christ is not a free membership. Yes, salvation is a free gift from God, despite the fact that it costs Jesus his life. However, becoming and remaining a disciple of Jesus will cost you. Meaning, here are a few Bible verses with different translations. Luke 14. You cannot be a disciple unless you love me more than you love your father and your mother, your wife, your children, and your brothers and sisters. This is Jesus talking. You cannot come with me unless you love me more than you love your own life. You cannot be my disciple unless you carry your own cross and come after me. Here Jesus is challenging us by saying, have those high priorities to follow after me. Same Bible verse, but New King James uh, translation, where he uses this one key word. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, and yes, his own life, he cannot be my disciple. So, frankly, here's one of these Bible verses. I had an issue with that. Let me read it again, guys. This is Jesus talking. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, how is that supposed to make sense? You know where I'm supposed to hate my father and mother and love you? When I was doing research in that word, the original context of that word, hate is not how we understand it. I hate you. What that word hate means is prefer. If you do not have greater preference, it totally changes things around. That's why it's very important for us that when we do read words, that we actually even go to the original context. Because I struggle with that. I remember hearing preachers, yeah, you gotta hate everybody and love Jesus. I'm like, well, aren't we supposed to love everybody? Yeah, but this Bible says you gotta hate mom and dad. Well, <laughs> and they got me confused. No, seriously, here I am, a spiritual green tomato trying to understand that, and the preacher's telling me, yeah, Jesus said so. I'm like, I know Jesus said many things, but it doesn't make sense. And when I begin to research that particular word and passage, Jesus was challenged, guys, you have to have a greater preference. That I need to become your top priority. And one more verse, Luke 14, 33. Again, Jesus talking. So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. 
Of course, to go back to this analogy, it's easy to take it out of context. I'm forgetting about my family, I'm forgetting about everything, I'm just following Jesus. Well, there's no wisdom in that. I remember when pastor shared his testimony, and he said, when I first got married, uh, most of my paycheck I would just give away to church to missions. And he goes, my family struggled. And me and my wife, we had many conflicts. And I kept on telling him, but honey, you know, the Bible teaches us to sacrifice everything for God and to give it all to God. Yeah, but I mean, you're, you're literally giving everything to God. There's nothing for us to eat at the end of the week. You see what I mean? So sometimes we can take so many passages of the Bible out of context and out of spiritual immaturity and jeopardize ourselves. But God doesn't tell us, you know, forget about everything and just follow me. He's just challenging us. Where is our heart? What is our preference? And what are your priorities in life? 